I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable in any context reciting a poem. I, I, uh, I don't necessarily think in terms of performing a poem, um, but my background's in theater. And so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable standing in front, but I'm comfortable sitting as well. <laughs> now, uh, you said your background is in theatre. Actually, initially, and this is what very few you know, I know to uh, read about you, is that your uh, first degree is in philosophy. Yes. Now, we do have a lot of philosophy students in Salzburg, but I think very few end up uh, <laughs> <laughs> rap and hip hop. What, uh, what made you um, And actually, it comes together when you read yes. your poems, right. it comes together very, very uh, obviously. But uh, just uh, from your background, I mean, what made you... What made me study that? Well, you know, I grew up in New York in the 80s. And so I, was, I grew up very inspired by hip-hop and the culture of the streets. My father was a pastor of a Baptist church. So I also grew up very inspired. Well, uh, inspired maybe isn't the right word for what I experienced from the church. I had a lot of questions. A lot of times I'd be upset. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, and I also grew up doing a lot of theater in school, doing a lot of Shakespeare. By the time I went to university, I, um, I had a lot of questions. And my father had told me that he would support me as an actor, which was my plan, um, if I got a law degree. In order to pursue a law degree, I was going to need to study either something like history or philosophy, something that would prepare me for the sort of testing that would lead me towards my law degree. And I started as a history major. And uh, I was bored. <laughs> and, uh, and essentially realized that I had some real questions about Western thought and Western ideology. I was interested in kind of deciphering the roots of why we think how we think, you know? And, uh, and so philosophy was, I guess, my attempt to, to find answers to those questions. I can't say that I found them there. Actually, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Many times. Exactly. Our litany of questions. Our litany of questions. And yeah, um, in fact, there's, there's, I think there's a poem in this book that says, uh, uh, the truth, if I was speaking the truth, there would be more questions. You know, I believe that there's, you know, that a lot of us find our strength in finding the answers to questions, but I think also there's a great strength in, in having the courage to raise questions. Actually, they are wonderful poems. I mean, uh, even from a from a literary, or literary critical perspective, you know, they are poems for the world loves to to read as well. I mean, when you when you compose, uh, when you write a poem, is it the rhythm that comes first, and then the words come to the rhythm, or is it the ideas and then the rhythm? It's usually the idea. Mm -hmm. It's usually the idea. And, uh, and, and then it's the, the process of writing. In order to get from one stanza to the next, um, usually I have to read and reread the stanza that precedes in order to be inspired to find what follows. But a lot of times I feel like a mathematician, like in, in, in this book, particularly in a lot of poems in this book, uh, I felt like a mathematician working out some kind of proof, you know, um, and, and so some sort of rhythmic, ideological, philosophical proof. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of crossing out, and, and, and of course the rhythm is, is there, and I'm, I'm, it, but the rhythm is, is, is never focused on. The, the rhythm comes naturally, um, and, and I like the intricacies of rhythm, the, the rhythm within language itself. Uh, you know, I hear um, not only the words, but the silences surrounding words and the syllables within the words and how they fit together and how they form new words and new ideas and new possibilities and sound and rhythm and an understanding. And uh, that perhaps comes a lot also from growing up in the church, uh, in, the, in the black American church. Uh, uh, I, I was definitely, I was never one that was, you know, very religious, so to speak, but as a technician, I would listen to ministers like my father and other ministers speak, and I, and I would and I would enjoy their playfulness with the language, you know. And, and as the sermons would get more, I mean, I guess internationally we're more uh, we're more we know people like Martin Luther King or even a modern day speaker like a Barack Obama or, or what have you. But you know, when I was going to church regularly as a kid, I heard some amazing ministers. By amazing, I mean that their, their elocution 
their ability to speak, and then eventually with the music, and how they would speak over the music and what have you, uh, was inspiring to me, especially because as soon as I would leave the church, I would go put on my headphones and listen to rap, and listen to hip hop, and I would see the connection. You know, and, and so yeah, there's, there's a lot that I learned from that. But the, 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 the rhythmic nature of poetry and of language is inherent. Um, it's not something that I search for. I think that we all um, encompass that. In, in fact, I learned a lot about that through studying the theater. Um, I found out a lot about uh, uh, chemistry. I, I remember doing a, a Sam Shepard play. And uh, I studied at, at NYU in the graduate acting program. We were lucky to have people like Sam Shepard come in and, and work with us. And I remember doing a play by Sam Shepard and at one point watching an argument happen between two actors on stage and realizing that it was not intentional by the playwright, but that the, that the actors were rhyming. That the actors had this sense of like, fuck you, well what about you, well what am I supposed to do, how was I supposed to know, well, where am I supposed to go? No, no. It wasn't intentional. And from that point I started listening to people argue, or when there was some sort of chemistry or romance between people and I started realizing that when there is chemistry, when there is a synchronicity between two people, that oftentimes we find a rhythm in how we dialogue and how we speak in everyday life. But actually, this is something that I noticed about your interviews, I and mean, in your interviews, you fall into a rhythm naturally, as you say. It's, it's natural. It's, it's, it's natural, natural, but I don't think it's just me. Yeah, but of course it is very natural to think it's like yourself. And it is what we call stress, time, and rhythm. And it's natural to the English language. It's not so natural to German, it's not natural, it's all to French. Mm. I mean, have you ever tried? Rap or hip hop in any other. Uh, yeah, when I when I first started, I was I was eight or nine years old, and I, I guess that age was a huge time for me because I did a few things that year. I started writing rhymes. I started as a rapper that year when I was eight or nine. I uh, I went to a magnet school in the U.S., which was a, a school where you could study art and what have you. And so I I started studying Shakespeare, and I did Julius Caesar that year, and I started taking French class, and so that year. I started trying, at first I started writing rhymes, but then because of my Shakespeare class, I started trying to write rhymes in Old English. Because of my <laughs> French class, I started writing rhymes in French and Old English. <laughs> and so, yeah, as a kid, I did, definitely. And I hear the musicality in French. I mean, people like Serge Gainsbourg, for example, to me, prove incessantly the sort of uh, nuance that can be found and the playfulness that can be found within the French language, and, and uh, yeah, and, and then also I lived in Brazil for a while, and, uh, and also in Portuguese, uh, I, uh, I discovered a lot. And I think that my ability to understand my own language increased somewhat from me learning another language. So I learned Portuguese when I was 16, and that very much inspired my, how I heard what was said in English and what have you. Now I live in Paris, and speaking French, all of these things helped to understand the nuance of language. Now you, um, you mentioned rap and hip hop and we, we heard about this and uh, you once said, I, had, um, I was mainly influenced by hip hop and I had to fight to prove it to my parents. Mm -hmm. What made you convince them? Uh, well, you know, when hip hop first started in the, in the early 80s, it wasn't political. Mm -hmm. It was party music. And it was a little crass, you know, like, people saying stuff about sex and what have you. And my parents didn't want to see me or hear me listening to that kind of music, especially since the best hip-hop radio would be on Saturday nights. And on Saturday nights would be the night that my dad was preparing his sermon for <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> so I'd be in my room, like, practicing break dancing, and be like, I'm trying to prepare for the Lord's Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I invested in headphones. <laughs> and, uh, but around the, the, the late 80s, mid to late 80s, hip-hop became political. Groups like Public Enemy and what have you. And so at that point, my parents suddenly realized that this was not just something that was happening on the street, that this was actually connected to the Civil Rights Movement, which they had been a part of, and the Black Power Movement, and all of these things. They started realizing connections. And so from that point, it was easy. And then my, my father was very open, for example, he would, uh, he, would uh, also, he would have like 
it's the 80s in New York, there was a huge anti-drug, anti-crack campaign and what have you. And my father used to have rallies, manifestations that would start at his church and then they would take it to the streets and he would tell me I'd be 12 or something. He'd be like, if you write a rap about, you know, why kids shouldn't smoke crack, I'll let you say it. At the church on Saturday, there'll be 1,500 people there. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'd be 12 writing a rap about why crack is bad, you know, and, but, and, and, and with the encouragement of my dad, he would give me the stage. No, we did the same with poetry, of course, as teachers of poetry. And some have argued that slam is the way to get poetry out of the classroom, uh, out of the textbook, into the street. And um, it, is, it said, um, writing songs is a solitary thing and in fact when uh, when i looked at those photographs showing you uh, in a sort of meditative solitary uh, position they said you locked yourself up in the room when you went to your room and on the other hand there is uh, saw williams performing and uh, performance is more than just the, the language is body language as well yeah. there is the acting there is this interaction with the, with the audience um is it are you two sides? Is it two sides? Uh, I guess it is two sides. You know, like for example, I spent the last year, as you mentioned earlier, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm about to release a new album in, in May. And I spent the last year, a year and a half, in the studio. Mm. And in the studio, there is no audience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I love the, the behind the scenes process of discovering, creating, finding the things that I will eventually take to the stage, you know? Um, and there's a great deal of fun to be had there. On the stage, there's something new, completely new that's found, because on stage, I, 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 uh, I, I may not be as into the nuance of language. I, I have musical shows sometimes where people are like, the music was too loud, I couldn't understand what you were saying. And for me, I'm like, the music was not loud enough. I'm not doing this, you know, like, I wasn't trying to get you to understand what I was saying. The, the, it's a musical show, you should be dancing. <laughs> not trying to figure out what I'm saying, that's what the books are for. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there, there's a difference, there, there definitely. But we're not talking about the end of the printed, uh, the, the printed poem, are we? I mean, after all, there are three collections, and uh, we're not talking about the end of the album, the hard copy, because the uh, music harvest is available on the yeah. way. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I don't think that, uh, of course, I, can, I just signed a, a new book deal last week. And that book will come in book form. <laughs> it won't just be an electronic book. I, my, some of my friends are publishers and, and booksellers and what have you. And yes, there's this fear of, of like, will books still last? And will hard copies? See? Yeah, I believe that they'll. I think that they'll all continue to exist. Um, in fact, you know, like I, I look at the page itself as a performance space. You know, yeah, that was I, a wonderful. Thing. <laughs> I wanted to show this, I wanted to show this, I mean, um, this is from Set the Short Gun to the Head, and the pages are like this, you know, with visual, very strong visual signs, and I was wondering, I mean, uh, I mean, reading this, of course, you have the visual mm -hmm. emphasis, when you read this, I mean, this is just the way you speak it out, I mean, is it speaking, does it correspond to the visual? Um, I, I think it might. I think it might. I mean, I, I mean, I've never tried too much. I, uh, I wrote, I literally wrote this book like this, like when I sat at the computer. I, uh, uh, in fact, it was crazier than that. The, the publishing company made me <laughs> because I wrote the entire, I wrote the entire book like a ransom note, like when you take a. a, a R from one letter, and a, every every letter was a different font. And the publishing company was like, this is absurd. <laughs> There's no way we can do this. We don't have the money to print anything like this. Um, and so I had to make it all the same font for the sake of publishing it. But um, I, I, guess, I guess perhaps it corresponds in a sense. My goal with that poem, with Set the Shotgun to the Head, and with the poem that preceded it that I read an excerpt of a minute ago called Children of the Night, was I wanted to write a poem where every stanza could stand on a page alone. You know, and and there's nothing that says that poetry has to look like it looked a hundred years ago. You know, um, I get in a lot of, of of not fights, but 
interesting conversations <laughs> with, uh, with you know professors of poetry and what have you, because uh, particularly about slam poetry, which honestly I don't know what that is. You know, um, I, I think of I think of the the great poet Homer, for example, and in the age of Homer, Homer was not a famous writer. Ninety-seven percent of Greece was illiterate. People did not read Homer when he was alive. They gathered like this to hear him recite poems. The different shakes provide Yeah, exactly. So what is the difference? What, what truly is the difference? It's only the past couple of hundred years of poetry where this written idea exists as the prevailing idea of poetry. But in the times of Lao Tzu, in the times of Kabir, in the times of Homer, poetry was recited. It was an oral tradition, the beginnings of poetry was an oral tradition.